Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Dr. John Verveke, um, a psychology and cognitive science professor at the University of Toronto. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Ben. Well, as you said, I'm a professor at uh, the University of Toronto in psychology and cognitive science. Um, I've written a book with uh, Christopher Master Pietro and Philip Misovic on zombies in uh, Western culture and how they are uh, an emergent mythology for expressing the meaning crisis. Um, I do a lot of work, uh, scientific work, research, cognitive scientific research, psychological research on meaning in life, uh, rationality, wisdom, intelligence, consciousness, um, and mindfulness. Um, I do particular work on mystical experiences and transformative experiences. And I drew on all of that uh, to try and address uh, what I've called the meaning crisis in, um, in our current civilization um, and try to articulate articulate a way in which we could integrate science, especially cognitive science and um, spirituality, so that both are mutually respective of each other and integrated in order to help afford people um, awakening from this meaning crisis, ameliorating it, addressing it, addressing it in their individual and collective lives. That's sort of m m my thing. That is quite a quite a few things, and uh, they're all very interesting. I think they overlap with a lot of um, uh, kind of renewed interests in both cognitive science in the field of psychology, and also kind of uh, spirituality and religion and uh, existentialism, especially. Um, yes. And kind of on that note, one of the themes that kind of revolves around a lot of your work is, uh, as you said, the the crisis of meaning and specifically meaning. And I feel like in order to have a discussion on the crisis of meaning, uh, it would be good if you could uh, try to define what meaning is. And I know that you tend to use sort of like a, the agent and the arena relationship. So kind of going off of yes. that framing. Yeah, that's an excellent setup. Thank you, Ben. Um, so first of all, um, the meaning I'm talking about is not primarily the meaning, uh, what's called semantic meaning, the meaning of your thoughts or your sentences, your spoken meaning. Uh, we're using that meaning as a metaphor. What I'm talking about is that sense of connectedness to yourself and to other people and to the world so that you are not overwhelmed by feelings of absurdity or alienation or anxiety. You don't feel that your life is awash in bullshit or self-deceptive, self-destructive patterns. And that your life is worth living, even given the inevitable failures and frustrations and faults that we all fall prey to. That's what I'm talking about. And so this is meaning in, in this existential, spiritual, sapiential, meaning having to do with the cultivation of wisdom sapiential sense and here we need to make one more distinction between the meaning of life and meaning in life um, the meaning of life is that the proposal that there's some sort of supernatural or um, cosmological destiny or plan uh, for you and that your job is to discover what that is and align yourself with it i'm agnostic about whether or not that could exist i suspect it does not for all of the reasons we see in the universe. Uh, but that's not what really seems to matter. Um, what matters for people is meaning in life. And even if they think they have the meaning of life, it only matters to them if they can translate it into meaning in life, the way in which that view helps to enhance their sense of connectedness to themselves, to each other in the world, so that life moves beyond being barely bearable uh, to being something in which you sense you are flourishing and those lives you touched are also being moved towards flourishing. That's what I mean by meaning. So I, I on that note, I'm kind of wondering, um, I ended up having, like when I was uh, researching psychology, I looked a lot at The Good Life and reading a lot of literature on The Good Life. And it's mm. 
in self-determination theory, they tend to see it as a mix between eudaimonic and hedonic uh, mm -hmm. benefits. So, so eude eudaimonic kind of being meaning or a meaningful flourishing, uh, like you've discussed, and hedonic being more situated in uh, discussions of uh, subjective well-being. And mm -hmm. I learned recently about, uh, it was one study conducted on, uh, some people appear to hold something distinct from these two, or maybe a, a better way to reify this mixture of the two, which is the psychologically rich life, which uh, mm -hmm. is, is instead of, they, they define meaning, uh, the meaningful life as kind of like trying to cultivate a legacy or a sense of purpose situated in a larger system. And then the happy life more is like a kind of a sensory uh, uh, pursuit. The mm -hmm. psychologically rich life is is the pursuit of wisdom, which um, is something that you you talk about quite a bit. Where it's it's less about the end goal, and it's more about just like uh, continually pursuing and gaining knowledge through this through the process of knowledge acquisition, rather than like what the knowledge is in itself. I, I wonder if you've if you've heard about this or. Yes, yes. Um, um, I think this is important work. Uh, I, I don't talk about a pleasure crisis because I don't see any evidence that our culture is suffering from that. In fact, I, I think our culture has been an overwhelming success at pursuing comfort, pleasure, contentedness, subjective well-being. Um, now, um, I do think our culture is conf often confusing subjective well-being and meaning in life, and that contributes to um, people being starved for meaning. Uh, we know that subjective well-being and meaning in life can vary independently of each other. The prototypical example is having a kid. Uh, when you have a child, uh, all almost all of the measures of subjective well-being go down. You're tired, you're hungry, you're wet, you're distressed, uh, um, you're unsure of what you're doing, your, your fundamental relationship to your closest partner is under stress and strain, your finances go down, your health goes down. But why do you do it? Because you feel connected to something um, beyond yourself that has a value and a reality beyond you. I, I hesitate a little bit in what you said because... Um, Defining meaning in life just in terms of legacy or purpose, um, it's close, but it's not right. Um, I, it, I would argue that purpose um, is um, one of four factors. The other are is how, how, much, how intelligible is your world? How much sense does it make to you? If your world isn't making much sense, that degrades meaning terrifically. Um, significance, how real how deeply real are your, are you having deeply real experiences in your life or are all your experiences while maybe hedonically satisfying, striking you as superficial and then mattering. And maybe they're trying to capture that with legacy. Mattering is to be connected to something that you think has a value, uh, uh, you know, above and beyond your own existence. So the way to determine that is to ask yourself, what would you want to continue to exist even if you did not? Um, and that's not quite the same thing as legacy. Um, but maybe they're trying to get close with it. Now, the idea of psychologically rich, I think a wise life um, is one that does a lot uh, toward getting sort of the optimal balance between um, pleasure and meaning. Uh, it tends to prioritize meaning because of the reasons I just gave you. People will prioritize meaning over pleasure reliably. Um, and that most of our virtues have to do with sort of constraining um, our pursuits of pleasure, not strangling them or killing them, but constraining them and affording our pursuits of meaning. Because these are the, these are the connections that largely develop us as persons and afford us an arena in which we can cultivate uh, virtue and wisdom. Where wisdom is this idea, the very, sa the very same adaptive process is that make you intelligent by connecting you to your body deeply, connecting you to other people deeply, connecting you to the world deeply. Those very same processes, they're highly dynamic, highly complex, highly recursive. They make you continually pray to very complex self-organizing and therefore very compelling forms of self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. So you need very complex systems for ameliorating that self-deception and restoring and enhancing the connectedness that's meaning in life. 
and then helping you properly cultivate good connectedness. That's what virtue really means. Um, and that's wisdom. That's what wisdom is. And another way of understanding the meaning crisis is as a wisdom famine. We've never needed wisdom more, and we have never been so unsure of what it is, where we go to cultivate it, how we're doing it well, et cetera. Um, the, yeah, no, that's a, a very interesting way to uh, kind of discuss wisdom. And I'm kind of wondering when you bring up like, because uh, it seems like wisdom is a lot about getting out of your own self-deceptive um, cognitions and uh, mechanisms. That seems to be uh, sort of another way of saying knowing what is truly real. And you were talking about kind of the coherence between meaning and and realness as yes. realness is one of the facets. And I'm kind of wondering how I can only think of realness in terms of maybe like cognitive coherence or like understanding that things are coherent. But I know there are a lot of things that are coherent, like fantasy novels, like books that are yes. these highly complex fictional worlds that they make sense, but I know they're not real. And then in terms of like affect and like, I don't know if it's exactly the same thing, but when Descartes talks about like, there are a lot of things in the world, like sensory things that we feel are real, but aren't actually real. So I'm, I'm wondering what's, what's a, what's a good way to actually uh, uh, find this sense of realness and, and could you define it in terms of uh, like wisdom? Yeah. And here's something uh, where um, I think uh, the philosopher scientist Polanyi has had a huge influence on me. And um, Esther Lightcap Meek's book, Contact with Reality, is a good exposition of Polanyi's position on this. And it's one I see also in um, especially people's discussions of the sacred um, or God or ultimate reality. Uh, what is it? Dis uh, ultimate reality isn't a thing. It's a property. It's a depth you're discovering in things, their realness. Um, and what what is this property? Coherence is part of it, but the coherence has to emerge from um, an inexhaustibleness. Um, this is one of the ways in which you can distinguish real things from apparent things or fictional things. They have an inexhaustible net to them. You, there is, there, like, there is even this object. There is no way to ever see all of the object ever. Right? There's all these different aspects, all these different, and then let alone all the ways it can interact, all the ways um, I can, you know, uh, uh, make it be part of something greater than itself, all the components within it. I mean, like just think about, you know, the, all of its history. There had to be supernovas billions of years ago making the elements that came together. Evolution, the asteroids had to hit their planet so humans evolved so that they would get the intelligence to craft this thing. Like, <sighs> That's the inexhaustibleness of reality, that tremendous moreness, and also the, 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 the suchness of it, the, the here, now, individual, unique presencing of this that I can't put into any category, right? And therefore, I can't actually capture by any words. I can only point to it and go, this, this. And then you things are stretched that way between those two poles, between an inexhaustibleness that is a perpetual fount of intelligibility, but that intelligibility only puts us in contact with something that we ultimately can't fully articulate because of its sheer uniqueness and presence, what the Buddhists would call the suchness. When you are in where intelligibility is that binding nexus point, there's an in inexhaustible fount coming in and it, and, and it keeps reminding you and affording you to come into the pure presencing of a thing, that is, I to my mark, some of the fundamental features of the sense of realness. Now, you can take a work, like a written work like Plato's Republic or the Bible, and when it starts to have that feature to it, right, it's in, that inexhaustibleness, that moreness into intelligibility that nevertheless binds us to a suchness that is beyond our, you know, our categorical grasp, like Plato's Republic is for me, or the Symposium, or the Bible, or the Tao Te Ching, people start to talk about that not just as a work of literature. They start to talk about it pointing to a profound kind of reality. It takes on a sacredness. So that's what I would, uh, that's what I would propose to you is 
uh, what we're talking about. It's not just coherence. Coherence is just this nexus moment, right, between these two profound poles of moreness and suchness. But it's it's an ongoing thing that, that the promise that that the, 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 that there will be new intelligibility that will point us to new unique uh, presencing. That promise keeps being kept again and again and again and again and again. And I can't give you any argument for that because all arguments presuppose that as the fundamental thing they're relying on. Um, that's uh, especially when you're kind of talking about the, the uh, kind of almost hard to grasp expansiveness or vastness of, of what is real. Um, it's, I think very reflective of like when Socrates says like wisdom is found through wonder or something similar yes. to that. And, and also um, I think it very much reflects if you're familiar with Keltner and Haidt's work on um, yeah. like awe and trying to yeah. define it. It's like a perceived vastness and a need for accommodation. Um, is, yeah, is this exactly. kind of true? Yeah. 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 Think and think about, and now to drop back, let's bring it back to your original point about it's connected to connectedness. Think about somebody that you love. Um, they have that moreness to them. You, you, once you start, once you really acknowledge they're real, and that's what Iris Murdoch said love is, acknowledging that something then other than yourself is real, you, sent, you just sense, oh my gosh, this, there's so much. I'll never, like, I'll, uh, you know, the depths of this person. And so there's that moreness, but there's also the suchness. There's, you get the uniqueness. You get, I couldn't replace this person with any other person. You get that moreness and the suchness. And then when you're realizing that, and think about the word, when you're realizing that, you feel profoundly connected to them. And that connection and realization makes you experience yourself as more real. Because there's something in you that is a find, that has affinity with the moreness in them and the suchness in, in, in them. That is how the realness and the connectedness are bound together. Do, do you think that that maybe... Uh maps onto Ernest Becker talking about there's kind of this fundamental ontological paradox um, that we have that for a while was kind of quelled through religion, which is we simultaneously want to feel like we're a part of something larger. So the vastness, and at the same time, we want to feel extremely unique. And so like God, for example, for, for a while gave us that sense of being in a larger system, but then also being like a, uh, we belong in that system because of our uniqueness. Then he goes on and says like in the secular age, now we look at like romantic partners as kind of trying to do that, but that can lead to kind yes. of unhealthy relationships. Is that kind of maybe a bit similar? I think it's very similar. First of all, I agree with uh, Becker that uh, we've tried to replace God with romantic relationships and romantic relationships cannot bear that burden. I've been making that argument uh, quite frequently um, mm -hmm. because romantic relationships do have that aspect of transcendence and imminence. But of course, God, I don't know if it's right to say possess, God instantiated those ultimately. Uh, and this, and then this goes to Tillich's thing is only the ultimate of transcendence and imminence should be worthy of your ultimate concern. So the, the way to become most real is to be bound to that, um, what T Tillich calls the God beyond God. Tillich also talked about this tension between individuation and participation uh, independently, as far as I can tell, and I think also before Becker. Um, and he, he defines it as, again, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the tonos. These, this is, these are the creative tensions um, that are unresolvable for us, and our, 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 the wisdom that we can cultivate is not in trying to resolve or stabilize this, but to learn how to live it as... Um, as adaptively as possible. Mm. Maybe it's like a bit of a, a dual process going on, on like a fundamental existential level. Um, I think most of our cognition, its adaptivity is built out of these opponent processes. Mm. Uh, they can be between your focused attention and your wandering attention. It can be between your parasympathetic and your sympathetic system, in your left hemisphere, your right hemisphere. It can be between individual uh, individuation, participation with respect to individual cognition and distributed cognition. You see at many levels, of, this is part of the work I do in relevance realization, at many levels of analysis and an interconnected recursive interactive 
fashion, you find this opponent processing going on, trying to make use of all of these fundamental trade-offs in reality. Mm, and yeah, and, and I'm happy you brought up relevance realization um, because at least, you know, I, I, I want you to define uh, the concept more, but but on like kind of just a, a basic level, it reminds me of kind of the idea that we have a lot of information now and we don't actually know how to navigate what's relevant. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, uh, could, could you say the crisis of meaning, a lot of it has to do with this kind of struggle for uh, finding mechanisms that allow us to find what is relevant? Totally. I mean, there, it, was, it, it is perennially the case that there is way too much information available to you. I mean, think of all of the ways you could look at different, all the different sort of sequences of how you could pay attention and what you could pay attention to in your room that you could fill up the rest of your life just, well, I'll look here, then there. Like, just think of it. There's all of those sequences, all of the various pieces of information available to you. Think of all of the information in your long-term memory and all the possible ways you could connect it. You could connect Aardvark, Batman, and the Nile River. You could find some connection there, right? And so, right, all, all of that. Um, there's all the sequences of behavior you can generate. I can move this finger, then this finger. I can move them together. And what you do, astonishingly, is you ignore almost the like the, the almost the like overwhelming majority of that. You ignore very very much of it in order to zero in on the relevant thing to pay attention to, the relevant things to be remembering, and right the relevant actions to be performing. Now, what's happened with the advent of civilization and literacy and then printing and then the telegraph, the television, the radio, and now social media is we have accelerated, we have magnified that perennial effect and then made it very urgent. Like you can ignore most of what's going on in your room and it's not very urgent to you. It's not like the walls out there getting pissed off if you're not paying attention to it, right? But in social media, there is that disclosure of the, you know, the combinatorial explosion of information available to you. And yet it's also demanding on you. It's urgent. And it's all, all of it's claiming that if you don't pay attention to me, your life's going to go crap, right? And that, this is of course the marketing. And so we've always needed relevance realization in order to zero in on the relevant information in an adaptive manner. We've always had to deal with the fact that that puts us at risk of ignoring the genuinely relevant information and deceiving ourselves. But that has that has been put on meth with social media and, uh, uh, and communications technology. And so we now more and more need wisdom. We have less and less resources for it. And we're less and less, can we just rely on the ancient forms? We have to learn from them by all means, but they have to be evolved, exapted, to deal with our current situation. Um, so d would you say, uh, I'm assuming there's, there's several uh, kind of factors that led to this, but would you say like social media is one of the primary uh, reasons why there's a crisis of meaning? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say, because you see, you see people way before social media, at least what we talk about in social media now, uh, you see prophets of the meaning crisis, you know, Nietzsche, um, it, it is a clear example, or uh, Tillich, who's writing in the 30s and the 40s, or Jung, right? And I, there's many others, and I talk about them in this series. So there's been, there have been people in the 19th century realizing that there had been a long historical process that had come to a dangerous fruition, and the rise of nihilism and secularism, and the possibilities therein of a kind of, of totalitarian utopias, all these kinds of things um, were prevalent before social media. What they did do, those earlier, um, I don't know, perioxums of, of terror, uh, is they, 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 provide us, uh, they provide a lot of people with good evidence that the legacy religions and the political ideologies are not going to satisfy this hunger for meaning. And so for many people, those avenues were destroyed in uh, the end of the 19th and the 20th century, the two world wars in particular, right? But also the genocides 
um, in, in, in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and the Khmer Rouge and etc. Um, so people people tried things other than you know uh, the traditional source. Oh, sorry, they fr they became disenamored of both. I should say I made a mistake there. They became you know, disenamored of both the traditional sources of wisdom and the new secular alternatives that were proposed. Um, and that exacerbated the meaning crisis very significantly. And then social media came on and it made a huge promise. This is its basic, it, it promised to address this. It would connect us. Think of the language. It would make us all connected and show us everything and make us more democratic and participatory. Um, so it promised to do that and uh, to alleviate the meeting crisis powerfully and in a very shiny and glittery way. And it has exacerbated the meaning crisis, therefore, even more powerfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it almost, uh, it feels like a, a, a bit like we maybe have lost control in the sense, like there isn't like a specific orientation that we're going towards. Like even like the narrative of, of progress is kind of... Uh, yeah lost its appeal and it, it reminds yes. me there's like that old zen there's an old kind of zen story that's about uh there's like a guy riding his horse uh for days and this this other man asks him uh where are you going and he goes i don't know ask the horse and I, and it's a bit <laughs> similar to the like you know like maybe you know when it comes to certain economic systems and ideologies we we and, and social media, it's almost like we, at least how I feel, is we don't really have a stake in where we're going with it at this point. I, and I think you, yeah. you recently, I agree with recently you totally. had a discussion I was... of, um, yeah, on, on a podcast about capitalist realism, and, and that kind of follows into it, like, uh, like Mark Fisher's idea that we don't really have much autonomy when it comes to these larger systems and how they dictate our lives. Yes. Yeah. yes. Sorry, there was a lag and I interrupted you. I apologize. Oh, no, that's, that's yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I was in the Czech Republic in September speaking there on the International Symposium on Democracy. And of course, they democracy is very recent for them, right? Um, they got, you know, the revolution in the 90s. And so therefore, it's, it's still very precious to them. But they're already concerned. Um, and, and one of the fundamental questions they were asking is, and this is why they were interested in my work about the meaning crisis and distributed cognition, um, they were already concerned with what's the telos of democracy? Where's it going? What's it for? Um, you know, once you're free from tyranny and totalitarianism, what are you free to? And, and, and um, th th I think this is just, you know, this is a profound realization. I, uh, and even the, the you know, a, 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 an attempt to deeply rethink freedom, to try and to take into account both those freedom from and freedom to. This is the problem with, with wealth. Wealth is tremendously excellent at freedom from. Wealth frees you from poverty. It frees you from being impotent. It frees you from a lot of these things. But it, right, it frees you from so much. But what does it free you to do? And, 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 we, and, we, and we don't have a good answer for that. And people are struggling, uh, you know, to try, kind of come up. You know, there was th this effective altruism idea, but that seems to have fallen into some serious uh, problems with, you know, the recent disasters. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's a, 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 a fundamental way of understanding. One of the things that, and this goes again, like I said, what one of the things that wisdom is, is it's freeing you from foolishness, but freeing you to flourish. It's but It addresses both fo foolishness and flourishment. And that is, um, and, and that's something we we've lost. Like I said, we tend to be truncated, oversimplified, and reductionistic in a way that has really um, hampered what the kind of dynamic complexity in our cognition, both individual and collective, we need in order to address the crisis. Hmm. I, I really, yeah, because it's, it's similar to, or maybe it's exactly what you're referring to, Isaiah Berlin's kind of two liberties and that there's a negative freedom and a positive freedom and it's usually used in political. Yeah. But yeah. 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 Um, going from that, and I think that's brilliant, like the idea that wisdom kind of offers a, an answer for both, like a freedom from um, this sort of wallowing and, and meaninglessness and then a freedom to flourish. 
um, or, you know, foolishness. Um, on first, on an individual level, let's say like a, somebody wants to go to therapy or they're like, a, they're just very depressed and they, they feel kind of a personal crisis of meaning. Um, how uh, could they go about kind of uh, navigating this and overcoming it and kind of becoming wiser? Um, and I do eventually want to expand this to the more kind of so on a social level, how we can do this. But I think starting at the personal level is useful. Sure. If, I mean, if it's acute, first of all, make sure that it is an issue around meaning. I mean, people get other things wrong with them. They can have experienced trauma or, uh, right, or, or, or et cetera. So uh, I, I'm asking for everybody to try and hear this as wisely as they can, right? First, determine if what you need is therapy or not. And if you need therapy, do it. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of an obvious thing. Uh, but what I would ask people to consider is they may not need therapy. They may instead want to avail themselves of other important interventions. Well, the things that's closest to therapy but isn't therapy that's about wisdom is philosophical counseling. You might want to seek out a philosophical counselor and what, because what they, are, what they do is they have learned techniques from, not techniques, that's, that's the wrong word, they've learned practices from the Socratic, Platonic tradition or the Buddhist, Taoist tradition, usually from many wisdom traditions. And they help you to unfold, right, the complexity of your foolishness, which is not the same thing as helping you deal, for example, with trauma, right? Those are different things. Now, sometimes they're mixed up together and sometimes you might need somebody who's got training in both. Uh, and that, that's a really good person if you can find that. So you might, if it's really acute, you might want to consider philosophical counseling. You might also want to, in addition to that, or um, instead of that, if it's not quite so devastating for you, you might want to seek out a community. And I would recommend some of these emerging communities where there are ecologies of practices that are, 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 have been directly created for trying to ameliorate the meaning crisis. Um, and of course, you have to take great care with that. Um, the paradox is you have to try and exercise as much wisdom as you can, which is the very thing you're seeking. Um, we're trying to put together a federation and, and things like this to help vet for people. Um, and I do want to caution people. There are charlatans. There are bad actors. There are people who are just deeply confused. You want to look for some, uh, an ecology of practice that has a lot of this, what I was talking about, opponent processing in it. It's layered. It's really grounded in the best cognitive science that we have. The orientation is on wisdom, not on the leader. There's a whole bunch of heuristics you can use. You want to take up an ecology, get involved with an ecology of practices. Um, and some of those should be um, ones that are done with, it should be dialogical practices, practices done with other people. So you want to, you want to have practices that enhance your inner dialogue, your outer dialogue. And, and, and it, I've got a lot of uh, uh, discussion. I just, uh, Jordan Hall and I recorded a thing with Jim Rutt that's going to come out where I talk about a lot, a lot of the design features you're looking for in a good ecology of practices. Um, and that's something um, I've talked about in many places. So you want to look for good design features. You want to look to see, is, is the community stable? Does it seem healthy? How are the people going into it? How are the people coming out to it? How many people want to stay related to it? How many people um, um, want to share it with other people spontaneously? Again, there's lots of things to look, and then you'll have to use, This is like looking for a friend or looking for a romantic partner or looking for a therapist. You, you know, explore carefully, cautiously, discerning, be patient. And, 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 you know, uh, and talk to people about your exploration, read up on the, the relevant science as best you can, and then find an ecology of practices that's homed in a healthy community, hopefully a community that's situated within a community of communities, and then undertake that, that ecology of practice with a kind of commitment, the kind of commitment you would make to friendship. The, one of the best metaphors and this is from the Buddhist tradition about cultivating wisdom is you're befriending yourself. Um, so use all the skills you would for entering into a long-term friendship, but also the commitment you would give to a long-term friendship to this community and to the ecology of practices. And then you will start to 
feel the changes um, that you are looking for. And this is not, I mean, this is, none of the virtues are completable. You don't go, you know what? I'm mature enough. I'm done. I'm honest enough. Right? No, you, you, these are things, these are lifetime. These are not goals. Uh, they're not places you're trying to get to. These are ideals that you will always be living by. And once you frame it that way, there are resources out there. There's a lot of stuff on my channel for free, meditation courses, contemplation, the cultivation of wisdom. There's communities. And, and they, you, on my channel, you can see people I'm talking to that are in these communities. Um, um, so there's a lot there. If it's really acute, try and find, first of all, determine if you need therapy or if this is really a meaning issue for you that has a spiritual dimension to it. Find a philosophical counselor if it's really acute. And then it may be not or after or in conjunction with seek out a, all right, a, an ecology of practices within a healthy community. Um, and when you bring up these ecology of practices, do you think um, their usefulness kind of reflects your, uh, when you talk about how we have a lot of, this is going back to the, we have a lot of information, but we have a lot of propositional knowledge, but we don't really have a lot of like perspectival, participatory, procedural, like, yeah, the, uh, yes. yeah if you yeah. kind of want to elaborate a bit more on, on that idea yeah and part of the meaning crisis is this propositional tyranny the meaning crisis has these many interlocking facets it's very dynamic and very complex as you might expect given what we've been talking about um so very quickly the with the advent of sort of the reformation and the scientific revolution we tried we it, 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 it had been gathering steam before in terms of a difference in reading practices, the rise of nominalism, etc. But we basically got to this place where we thought of propositional knowledge as what knowledge is. Propositional knowing is knowing that something is the case, that cats are mammals, and this is stored in your semantic memory as a fact. You, be you believe it, and you believe it to be true. And so we judge these things as true or false. You have procedural knowledge, procedural knowing, which is knowing how. It's knowing how to do something how to swim, how to catch a football, how to kiss somebody you love, how to kiss somebody you love who's your child, different from how you kiss your partner, your romantic partner, et cetera. Like there's all of that and it's complex. It doesn't result in belief, it results in skills. Skills aren't true or false, they're active or not. I notice that you're not trying to make use of your skill of swimming here because it doesn't apply, it doesn't engage in this situation. So that engagement and application it's not truth conditions, it's application conditions that we're looking for in a skill. And the sense of realness isn't truth, it's power. It's that it's ability to change the course, the causal course of things around us, right? And that's stored in a different kind of memory called, prosaically enough, procedural memory. There's your perspectival knowing. And each one of these is dependent on the one I next name. Your, your propositional knowing depends on you. You had to do a lots of procedural knowing before you can do your even language use, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'll just, I won't go into that. I'll, I'll just point to that. And there's arguments extant for that. Your perspectival knowing is knowing what it's like, knowing what it's like to be you here right now in this state of mind, in that situation. And we have a word for that. It's a word from vision. It's a, so we're using it metaphorically. It, that's your perspective. That's your perspectival knowing. And it's not about beliefs. It's not about skills. It's about how present you are, how, how much you feel that you're really in the situation. And that is stored in episodic memory. This is your ability to remember events like your last birthday. And you, what you do is you go in and you can relive them. You have a perspectival presencing. You're in them. You live them again. You don't just merely remember them. You're not reliving anything when you think cats are mammals, or right? That, that doesn't make any sense. And then below that and underwriting all of it is your participatory knowing. This is that, these are, this is that fundamental connectedness I was talking about. Um, it has to do with the way physics and biology and culture have co-shaped you and the world so that you have you can assume various forms of agency roles and there's corresponding arenas in which those roles make sense there are agent arena relationships so there are affordances so physics has shaped this and this right biology has shaped me and made me me like made us 
tool makers and then culture shaped this and then taught me how to use it. So this is graspable to me. It affords grasping. There's an affordance here. The grasping isn't in this or in this. There's been all this co-shaping so they fit together and that fitting together is a sense of affordance between an agent and an arena. So what participatory know, know, knowing generates are affordances. The floor is walkable. The chair is sitable. Those affordances are there for you. You make them salient to you in your perspectival knowing, the ones that you're now right directly aware of engaging in. Once you are situated, think about situation, then you know which skills to activate. That's your procedural knowing. And as you're activating your skills, you're acquiring factual knowledge, your propositional knowledge. Though, And so what we've tended to do is we've lost connection from the other three. I mean, they're still there operating, but we don't we don't appreciate them in all the senses of that word. We don't appreciate. And so we don't engage in practices that help to educate, in both senses of the word, educe, to draw out and develop, and also to inform. They don't educate the non-propositional knowings in a deep or connected manner. And that's where most of the wisdom machinery and the meaning mach making machinery is. And so these ecologies of practices, to finally come back to answer your point, are, are, are very much designed to emphasize the, the, you know, the education, the alignment, right? The mutual you know, connectedness of these kinds of knowing such that you can enhance your connectedness to yourself, to each other, and to the world. That's what exactly what these ecologies are about. Now, you should not make a mistake. The fact that they are emphasizing the non-propositional doesn't mean they get a free pass so they don't have to pay attention to any of the propositional knowledge coming out of science. See, this is something we, we, that you, you, that's not viable, right? Anything that's, oh, well, not science, but here, come to my thing. For me, and if people want me to argue this at length, I can. Anybody who says this, now, this position can have some critiques of aspects of the scientific worldview. Every good wisdom tradition should critique the current cultural theoretical system, but it shouldn't be dismissive or rejecting. It should enter into respectful dialogue with scientific theory. So, yeah, so I, I guess it's kind of avoiding that Kierkegaardian kind of leap of faith of uh, kind of ignore certain uh, propositional knowledge and and prioritize the belief in itself is that kind of like the like we should we should ideally come up with these sort of ecologies of practice that are like uh still tied in some way to to propositional knowledge well um educating and focusing on on these other uh kind of uh, yeah cognitive knowledges yes to what you're saying I, i'm not i, I don't t totally agree with how you've interpreted kierkegaard's leap of faith but the way people do um, sort of culturally interpret what Kierkegaard meant by that. Um, yeah. Uh, where faith is understood as the assertion of belief without evidence, I, I, I'm deeply critical of that. I, I would argue that when you get into Kierkegaard, especially because of his profound engagement with Socrates, that is not his notion of faith. Um, it, there's something different uh, going on there. Um, but I, I get your, I, I take your point and um, yeah. Yeah. Anybody that says ignore, right, that you ignore all of that and just adopt my vision without question, that don't don't get involved with that kind of person. Um, you, I mean, they should earn your respect. They should earn your trust. They should not demand it ever. Um, so kind of on a more social level then. So we, we've kind of talked about the distraught individual um, dealing with a crisis of meaning, but now more uh, looking broadly, how, how could we as a community, as a, as a country globally kind of escape or deal with this crisis of meaning, uh, understanding that this is, this is uh, an extremely complex uh, question to answer. So first of all, I mean, we need to get back to deep dialogical processes. Um, uh, dialogos is to conversation uh, uh, what, you know, it, it's similar to 
the what, you know how therapy is to go. we don't think of therapy as i just go in and talk to somebody we think no no there's a whole set of practices using language using the using the imaginal sense of imagination using enactment you, all of this right in, in order to try and not just inform people but transform them dialogos is like that uh, uh, it's a, it's a way in which people are conversing with each other such that it has these properties you people get into a reciprocal flow state right and and they start the the conversation starts to take on a life of its own and it starts to take them into their depths and in, in the depths of each other and both people start to realize they're going places they did not expect and they're getting insights and realizations and questions that they could not have got to on their own. And you know what I'm talking about. And it's this is the Logos. And Heraclitus, uh, the ancient philosopher, represented it like an, a fire that catches, right? Um, and Plato used the same metaphor in the seventh letter. So with Christopher Master Pietro and Guy Senstock and other people like Taylor Barrett and Peter Lindbergh and a whole bunch of people, we are trying to, we, we've created you know, a pedagogical program where you, you, you look like meditative practice, a contemplative practice, some circling practices, some paraphrasing practices, some philosophical fellowship practices, and then you go into this dialectic into dialogos. And what happens is people, first of all, say something really important. They say, I discovered a kind of intimacy that I didn't know existed, but I've always longed for, Right. Uh, because they've been told, no, there's these, there, there's sexual intimacies, there's family, and there's friends, and you know, and then they go, wait, there's there's this fellowship intimacy that I, that's really important. So you you know, now dialectic into dialogos isn't a practice you do on its own. Everybody has to be engaging in on their own or in small groups in ecologies of practice. So you have these bottom up ecologies of practices, and then you have this top down dialectic into dialogos. What's it doing? It's allowing people to educe, to educate, to become actually aware of the power of collected in, uh, intelligence within distributed cognition. Look, we network computers together and we release the power of distributed cognition. We're making distributed computation, I should say. We're making use of it right now. The internet relies on distributed computation and it has a power that no individual computer has. It's the same thing with the collective intelligence of distributed cognition. And there's now sort of formal evidence and arguments for this. It has an intelligence that supersedes just summing together the intelligence of the individual participants. And that, that can go from being a fact you might believe to something, an ex a transformative experience you can actually have. That's dialogos. So we need to have people engaging properly into dialectic, into dialogos. And there's many different versions of this. It doesn't have to be the particular version I, I, I teach. There's a family of these, right? That's growing. We need to keep growing that. We need to reformulate democracy and understand democracy as using opponent processing within the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and understand that democracy could be the, for the cultivation of collective wisdom rather than just in our individualistic uh, uh, pursuits. And this is what I was arguing at the symposium. And what that needs is that needs real, real electoral reform. I am a firm believer that the arguments and the evidence that we have to replace first past the post with better forms. I think, uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, D21, where you know, people have multiple votes, and they uh, 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 and and they can and they can't give any they can't give more than one vote to any one candidate, and they have to distribute. When you do that, you get the exact opposite. First past the post rewards extremism and populism. D twenty one punishes it and makes people learn about multiple candidates and multiple positions, makes them meta-perspectival, makes them talk to many different groups of people. They become more wise. The, the whole society becomes more wise as it moves beyond populism and extremism, polarization, all the stuff that really is really strangling democracy right now. If we pair the cultural emergence with with the cultural emergence of dialogical practices, again, always situated with ecologies of practices, with a reformation of the machinery of democracy and give it the telos of fundamentally engendering the collective wisdom we all need right now, I think that's how at a social level we could dramatically improve our society. That needs one more thing. 
that need, means we also need to create an educational system that removes the fundamental orientation of education being towards the market. I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare people for that, but we should remember that the, and this is Zach Stein's idea, the fundamental goal of, edu of education is to facilitate intergenerational and communitarian collective intelligence. We have to be educating for wisdom. If we did those three things, much more dialectic, many more dialectical practices that, and groups that we belong to, reformulate democracy, properly educate uh, for intergenerational ratcheting of collective intelligence and for wisdom. That's how we could. That's how we could fundamentally address this. All of these are doable. All of these have been done. Each one, like they, we have, uh, there's proof of concept of all of these. So anybody saying, "Oh, that's all pie in the sky bullshit," no, you're lying. The, the Nordic countries did the Bildung movement. They were originally agrarian, poor, authoritarian. This is Lenny Anderson's work and others. And they created the, basically these secular monasteries that did exactly what I'm talking about. And they went from these poor agrarian authoritarian countries into the countries they are today, which are some of the best places in the world to live. The Bildung movement existed. It worked. Anybody who says this is pie in the sky, they are lying to themselves because there is historical examples. There's all kinds of scientific evidence that we are better in dialogical groups than we are as individuals, even on fundamental reasoning tasks. And, the, and, and, the, and the, I, when I was at the symposium, I saw the hard evidence, modeling, simulation, experimental, that these changes, these electoral reforms fundamentally work. All of these proof of concept has been done, had, has been done, done, done. These are not pie in the sky. They are real possibilities. All that we lack is the political will to exercise them and bring them into existence. I, I do not think that sounds pie in the sky at all. I think I think usually when you ask uh, people how do you, in, in various ways, how do you kind of uh, change the world for the better, they tend to give pretty abstract answers. But that was, I, I think that was, those were very three very concrete um solutions and uh, uh very very impressive uh, how coherent they are with with everything else you've been talking about um thank which you which it also makes me kind of want to on a kind of we're almost at an hour um uh i i want to ask on a, on a personal level how you've dealt with the crisis of meaning um or just you know it seems like not in like in a an acute sense perhaps i don't really know uh how uh personally, you've been affected by it. But in some sense, everybody deals with their own sort of uh, um, ignorance and foolishness. And uh, I, I was drawn to your work because I remember in, in high school, I was quite sad uh, for much of it. And then when I started really uh, kind of engaging with the world and, uh, you know, joining sports teams and and traveling and and reading a lot of like philosophy and psychology, and and I even, you know, it's, it's what started the channel. And uh, I felt like it was like I kind of was able to in some sense get past yeah. it not that I'm like even you know it's a process it's not a as you said you're not going to achieve full uh, or at least for most people you're not going to achieve full enlightenment or anything but but I felt like I because I was uh, dealing with those other forms of cognitive knowledge that you discuss um, that I, I was able to uh, kind of get over myself or, or self transcend yeah. in, in some way, like, uh, depending yeah. on how you want to say it. So I'm, I'm wondering for you, what, what personally, what personal experiences you've kind of had uh, along a similar, uh, dimension. Oh, well, I have very profound version because I was brought up as a kid in a fundamentalist Christianity. And I, 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 which uh, only upon later reflection and therapy I found was deeply traumatizing to me, but I broke free from it. And then I experienced a profound, um, meaning crisis, uh, and and um, and and I, I won't go through the biography, uh, uh, but the point is, it led me into an ecology of practices, um, and, and that has only grown and developed, and that led me into the science for understanding the cognition and what's going on in this ecology of practices, and 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 my life is sort of shaped about I, so I, I deeply partake every morning right before. We got together. 
I, I did, did, you know, I do an ecology of practices and with all of these design features that I'm talking about that I've learned from other people. And then I've, uh, I've engineered, if that's the right word, on the basis of the science that I've read. And I also share it with other people, on mutual correction, etc. cetera. Um, and so um, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm a deep, I, I'm a, a deep participant in everything I've been talking about, but also I, 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 I'm a cognitive scientist and a psychologist who gets to actually also scientifically study all of that. And so I can, and I can talk to both communities and I can talk to, and I can have these two domains of my life talk to each other and educate and correct, uh, you know, that opponent processing thing. Um, and there you go. Um, that's that, 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 and, and it, like, if I'm sick or, Sometimes I, I get caught out because I, I lose a chunk of time because of travel and, and time zones. And when that happens and I don't get to do uh, my practices or I go, don't, go, don't get to do them very fully, I feel it. And I don't mean I just feel it like in, in a sort of just, I mean, I do feel it in a visceral sense, but I also feel it emotionally, affectively, cognitively, um, in my, even my ability to connect everything. I can feel it degrading. Uh, in so many domains of my life, um, and so I miss my practices like the way I miss a good friend if I don't if I don't engage in them. Um, so yeah. I was just going to say that that's a, that's something I want to say to people. Initially, doing this is demanding, but that's so is you know you know entering into a profound friendship. Right, you have to invest time and energy and commitment, and you have to suffer with people and undergo with people and allow them, right, to uh, to make demands on you. But the reward you get out of it is a profound friendship. It's the same thing when you're doing these. You know, how could I possibly do this? First of all, just take an hour away from your cell phone, and that's all you need to get started, right? Um, and so just think about that. Really, just think about that. Um, you could even take more than an hour, right? And, and then, like I said with enough commitment and transformation these practices become profound friends for you profound friends and you will you will be more than grateful that you did this whenever i'm teaching people like meditation tai chi chuan any of this the reasons why they start are not the reasons why they stay they, they start i want to reduce stress blah, blah, blah and that's that happens but then they find something else and that's why they stay could you uh, just really briefly, you know, because I'm, I'm sure there are, you have resources online about this, but what are what are some of the, the specific practices uh, you engage in, especially, you know, for example, this morning? Well, this morning is a little bit truncated because uh, I've hurt my hip. Uh, uh, I hurt my hip doing one of my practices quite, uh, quite powerfully. Uh, so I do Tai Chi Chuan and I was doing, and I do three forms, a fast form, a sword form and a slow form. And I was doing them with weights on my wrists and my feet to in order to increase the balance and the demand, right? It make error more, more prominent. But I had, I had re-injured myself. I was at Rafe Kelly's Return to the Source doing his ecology of practices, the parkour and the rock climbing and the martial arts. And, and I re-injured uh, an old injury in my hip. I thought it had healed. So I was able to just do the Tai Chi and then I put the weights on and I re hurt my hip. So this morning I wasn't able to do that. Let's say, let's, let's hope <laughs> that I completely heal. This is what it normally looks like. I get up, um, uh, I do, um, some, some, uh, what are called Jen Jung. These are standing meditative postures. Um, and then I, I do my three Tai Chi forms, a fast form, a weapons form and a slow form. Notice there's lots of opponent processing there right? Between, right. And those are all moving mindfulness. Then I sit and I do uh, uh, a, a bunch of Qigong practices that are embodied meditative practices. And then I do a meditative practice, uh, basically drawn from the Vipassana tradition. Then I do a contemplative practice drawn from the Neoplatonic tradition. Then I do Lexio Divina, which is a way of reading a text, not for information, but for transformation. And then when I can, I engage with other people in philosophical fellowship and dialectic and dialogos. I, I used to belong to a circling group um, that I went to regularly, but COVID killed that. It's not clear how it's going to get uh, going. And then I also do participant observation in other people's ecologies. I did Rafe Kelly's Ecologies of Practice. I've done 
empathy circling with Edwin Reutsch. I've gone to a Buddhist insight dialogue. I did uh, uh, Rafe Kelly's uh, re re Return to the Source. I'm doing Iris uh, Stremberger's uh, Wisdom Project right now. So I also do participant observation. So, so that's that's typically what I do. That is, uh, I think you could make a very interesting uh, video on your morning routine. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that doesn't exist already. That sounds quite interesting. Um, I, I just want to say one thing about that before we bring it to a close. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do all of those practices. I don't do that. I talk about domains where you should be, you should have some kind of mindful, you should have practices in the mindfulness domain. You should have practices in the dialogical domain, et cetera, et cetera. I talk about the domains where there should be practice. And then I talk about design features like opponent processing that's layered. There's a prop, proper pedagogical progression of, uh, 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 of the practices. That's what people should pay attention to. So that you should have sort of objective demands put on you by the design principles and the domains. And then within those objective demands that you're not allowed to fudge on, you should find what best takes for you, what best works for you. Don't just do the autodidactic, you know, dilettante. Oh, I like this and I like that. No, no, no. Really take seriously these objective design principles and their domains. But once you take that on and you're committed to that, then explore within each domains and practices what right. what best gets you good design features in all of these domains? That's what uh, that's how people should do it. I am not saying people should replicate my practice. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a deeply personal uh, pursuit. Also, it's simultaneously personal and non personal. It's, so in that sense, it's mm -hmm. transpersonal. It should really fit you, but it the the, the the but it should also it should fit you, but it should also fit you to objective demands uh, so that you have a real relationship to the cultivation of wisdom. Hmm. I think that's a... Uh, Again, think about, yeah, think yeah. about like a friend. Your friend should fit you, but you can't just impose yourself on anybody, mm -hmm. right? There's objective demands. You have, right? They have to fit you, but you also have to fit yourself to them. Mm -hmm. Think about it like that. Carry with it the befriending metaphor. Yeah, I think uh, my, my brother is very into meditation and stuff, and, and his whole goal in life is to become like a, a good friend to himself, and that's kind of what he yeah. it's, it's, it kind of reminds me of that. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a, if you have anything else to add, I think that's a very good way to, to kind of end it on a more practical note. I know we, we talked about a lot of different things. Um, very, very interesting. Um, if you If you have anything else to add. Just, just thank you, Ben, and tell me when this goes up, and uh, because I'd like to be able to review it at some point, mm -hmm. um, and I'll also promote it on all my platforms when it goes up. Perfect. All right. Thank you for uh, having me, and uh, or thank you for coming on. And you can you can uh, check out his YouTube channel, uh, John Verbeke's YouTube channel. I'll link it in the description. Um, 